Good morning, everyone. Um, so just as the speakers from uh, yesterday's uh, very lively sessions have done, the way I've structured this talk is not as a research paper, but as a series of thoughts that when put together, hopefully highlight a very urgent task that is staring us straight in the eyes. And that's the need to demolish, demolish the current development business an emphasis on business. And in its place, we need to produce a process that actually responds to our people's aspirations. The fact is, we cannot continue marching on this hybrid path of pro-Africa statements on the one hand and anti-Africa policies on the other hand. We also cannot continue to outsource our children's future to powers that are hell-bent on keeping us relegated to the role of producers of cheap raw materials and labor and consumers of their obsolete goods and rules. We need to enact, not just talk about, enact drastic change. But we can't do this within forums and institutions that are designed to uphold a rigged international economic system. But before we dive deeper into the conversation about the role of this rigged international economic system in perpetuating Africa's underdevelopment, I would like to invoke and acknowledge that we are standing on the shoulders of giant African revolutionary figures, past and present, who have tried and are trying time and again to warn us about all of this and to steer us away from the dangers of blindly following this rigged version of development. These African revolutionaries, past and present, warned us about debt and neocolonialism. They warned us about the various tools of economic subjugation and capitalist exploitation. They warned us about white elephant projects and adopting blueprint and poverty reduction strategies that respond to the interest of ex-colonizers instead of responding to our people's aspirations. They warned us about black skins in white masks amongst us. <laughs> but they didn't just warn us, eh? They also tried and are trying to empower us and remind us that we have the right to set our people free. We have the right to own our development processes and objectives and sequence our nation building steps according to our context and our needs. That we have the right to eject, eject spoilers from our lands and that we can terminate or renegotiate deals. Those of the past gave us and those of the present are showing us the tools and the language and the resolve it takes to refuse what doesn't serve our people. Please note, I am invoking our revolutionary history and ancestors, as well as living revolutionary examples, examples that are deliberately demonized. Case in point, my president, Isaias Afuerke. Because that is exactly what we need to get out of this upside down development shahr <laughs> or juju that has hooked itself to Africa. We need revolutionary mindsets. We need revolutionary attitudes. We need revolutionary commitments. We need an unapologetically pro-people, pro-Africa spirit that centers African aspirations when dealing with the Bretton Woods institutions or any other development partners for that matter and when fighting Western domination. I'm speaking about Africa as a single giant potentially powerful entity. Because honestly, unquestioned assumptions of universal patterns based exclusively on the interests of Western nations have often resulted in this entire continent serving as ground zero for development ex experiments or a case study to explain why Africans keep failing. When we speak of Africa as a country, it doesn't mean that we are trying to discount the historical nuances of our individual countries. But I strongly believe that as long as these lords of poverty subject all of us to the same economic and political whiplash, then we too must unite in our efforts to create a common language that amplifies solidarity and pressures our governments to abandon short-sighted 
expedient, haphazard policies and silo mentalities. Instead, we must push for a unified bargaining power, understanding that unity in our analysis of the situation and unity in our resistance is the only mechanism that will lead to, to Uhuru. Just as they are united against us, our countries must be united as we aim to meet our African aspirations. At this juncture, allow me to define what I mean by African aspirations for the purpose of this talk. African aspirations to me include the right to peace and to coexist peacefully within our regions and continents. The right to create political and governance structures that seek to reflect our social makeup and serve us in all aspects, not weaponize our fault lines or our weaknesses. Eh? The right to development and to set our own development agenda, including sequencing and implementation processes. And here we also include the right to food, water, health, education, etc. The right to form alliances with countries near and far that are based on mutual respect and interests. The right to participate in the creation of new global structure that are not beholden to one pole or another. Or the right to occupy our rightful place in existing global spaces and to drive their complete overhaul, not just cosmetic reform. The right to produce and contribute to global knowledge production that forms the basis for setting international norms, rules, and relations. And lastly, the right to anchor all of the above all of our policy decisions, all of our interactions on the well-being of future generations. I don't claim that this is a comprehensive list of our aspirations, but at least it's a starting point for examining Africa's status in the world and how the current global environment supports it in its quest to attaining these aspirations. I must now say that the gatherings such as this one and the launch of Afro Institute, uh, Afro-Asia Institute couldn't happen at a more opportune time. It is a testament that in spite of the many attempts to gag, gag our revolutionary heroes, whether through assassination, sabotage, demonization, their spirit remains resilient and it keeps manifesting itself through our understanding, through our recurring realization that things are not okay in Africa. And in many, many parts, things are not okay because the development and financial landscape that Africa was thrust onto at independence and finds itself navigating today was not created by it, for it, or even with it in mind. And almost seven decades later, we're unable to extricate our people from this hoodwinking landscape and build a truly meaningful Africa-focused, Africa-centered alternative. As far as the current global economic architecture is concerned, the fact is we were never consulted about its rules, never. Let alone consulted, Africans weren't even considered humans worthy of respect or rights at the time when these rules were written. Eh? And yet they've bolted these rules to our doorsteps and we've been forced to obey them ever since. <laughs> and you know what happens to a country or a leadership that actually says, Wait a minute, these rules are not actually working for my people. Democracy finds them. And you know what I mean by democracy finds them, right? Exactly. The international economic system and the system is within which Bretton Woods institutions function is rigged, is rigged. And it's rigged in favor of yesterday's colonizers. And it's there to maintain, albeit in a very politically correct language, the exact same systems of exploitation and subjugation that existed during colonialism. Furthermore, the racist mentality that drives these systems is the exact same racist mentality that just a short while ago was perfectly fine with apartheid, Jim Crow laws, Jim Crow laws lynching, colonialism, and of course, enslavement of our ancestors. Knowing all of this, one would not be faulted to think that these organizations that function as the proprietors, the sole proprietors of development knowledge, are actually tools of imperialism. They don't work for us, ladies and gentlemen, because they weren't designed to work for us. And so the African condition that this system of continued economic exploitation has caused, with the help of its very obedient African comprador class, 
leads one to conclude that as long as we continue to shy away from having revolutionary attitudes when we deal with these bad Samaritans, bad Samaritans is a concept that I borrowed from Ha Jun Chang, a former economist, then in 25, 50, 100 years, we'll still be talking about the same stuff and the same challenges. We'll be in the same or even worse position relative to Africa's potential and relative to Africa's aspirations. When thinking about the role of Bretton Woods institutions in its relentless underdevelopment cycle of Africa, we must always remember that in July 1944, eh, when America invited its allies to a place called Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, African countries were still under colonialism. And there was a ruthless system of primitive accumulation in place that was designed to siphon off raw material and resources from our lands, the periphery, and create create piles and piles of surplus in their countries, the core. We must also remember that the articles of agreement that later formed the World Bank and the IMF are based on pre-written plans that the British and the American came to the meeting with. The other countries at the meeting didn't have much input. We must also remember that these same powers who preach democracy and accountability to us run these mafia institutions in the most unaccountable fashion, with the US always ruling the World Bank and the Europeans always ruling the IMF, both through what they called a gentleman's agreement back in those days. When Africa was eventually inserted into the conversation, the IMF and the World Bank didn't actually change to meet its needs. They acted to maintain, maintain the economic subordination of African colonies that were now declared independent to Western monopoly capitalism and geopolitical maneuvers. They promoted their own corporate interests over African national interests. They enforced policies that cemented neoliberalism and ensured the corporate capture of development processes across the continent. And we all know the horrific results of structural adjustment programs of the 80s and the development blueprints that were shoved down African throats based on the Washington consensus. All of this with absolutely no regard for national objectives and strategies. These bad Samaritans kept showing up at our doorstep with advice and loan in one hand and cold-blooded conditionalities in the other hand. Mind you, conditionalities that they themselves did not enact when they embarked on the journey of nation building. Liberalize your trade, drop all tariffs, privatize everything, including basic human services, health, education, water, trim your public sector bare to bare bones, open your markets, forget about protecting your industries. In fact, why even think about creating industries? No, 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 just give us your raw material at dirt cheap price and we will shower you with finished goods. <laughs> You want to build roads? No problem. We will give you loans that you will spend generations to service. They didn't tell us that we will spend generations to service, but this is how it worked. Mind you, these loans that they gave us and continue to give us are in reality made up of our own money. I really need you to understand this. They are made up of our own money, meaning they're not giving us anything but our own wealth back to us, now calling it loans and grants and whatnot. How? Remember the exorbitant amounts of surplus that they accumulated when we, while we were colonized? That's what I'm talking about. This is not a conspiracy theory or something you know, out of this world. These are all documented facts. So in effect, their benevolence is rooted in slavery, colonialism, neocolonialism, and imperialism. These are all important points to keep in mind because it allows us to interrogate their motivation, their interest, and their objectives. It also allows us much needed shift in our mentality. We are not the recipient in this donor-recipient dichotomy that they drilled into our consciousness for too long. Nope, we are the owners and they are the thieves, period. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not, there are no poor countries in Africa. We have developedly, deliberately underdeveloped countries. And I borrow the definition of underdevelopment from one of my favorite giants, Walter Rodney. I've also come across other African scholars who use terms such as impoverished and plundered countries. Anything but poor, we are not poor. These are all active verbs because our impoverishment is actually a very active act. 
I think, again, it's important to stress and highlight this point about language because for far too long, the internalization of belittling or patronizing concept has led us to subconsciously feel inferior to those who show up at our doorsteps claiming to have all the answers to our development questions. Sorry, but we cannot begin to tackle challenges if we don't commit to examining everything, including language. Therefore, we must, in every discussion, reject our condition as some contextless phenomenon that is typical to us. Now, I sometimes find myself battling a seesaw of anger and sadness. Anger by the fact that this scam has been allowed to go on for this long and saddened by the fact that too many of us, especially those of us in government who actually deal with these partners, almost never begin the conversation about the African condition by centering the colonial context and sequence of events that led to this condition. And they're almost never unapologetically revolutionary in terms of their um, intera uh, interactions. But most of all, I remain angered and saddened by the fact that year after year, summit after summit, <laughs> we continue to go with them pan in hand and expect different results. We allow the Bill Gates of this world to own our seeds and teach us about agriculture. We allow some obscure foreign entity in the UAE to own and profit off of millions of hectares of land through the carbon offset system. We allow them to drive the climate change debate without actually telling them, you caused this disaster. And on top of that, we allow them to continue siphoning off our unfair prices, the raw material needed to build all this green technology. And then they'll come to us and say, we can give you this technology through loans. <laughs> we know that opening our markets protectionism, all of these things that they told us not to do is actually what we need to do to develop our thing. We know a lot of that. We know that before we even invite them to our countries, we must have a bulletproof long-term national development strategies that we have authored. Development strategies that aim to empower every section of society, beginning with the most marginalized. We know this and much more. And yet we continue to enact development policies handed to us by these lords of poverty and give us the same results over and over again. What is wrong with us? When will we say enough is enough? Ladies and gentlemen, every now and then they may come up with new buzzwords, new language and try and convince us, no, we've learned our lesson and now we are trying to reform. <laughs> But you know, in the end, it's all driven by the same exploiting classes and condescending racist mentalities mentioned earlier. The same mentalities that saw no issue with 30,000 Palestinians being slaughtered. No issue with, no issue with subjugating Haiti, the beacon of freedom to continued neocolonialism. No each issue with preaching human rights while using children's, children to suck minds in the DRC. No issue with igniting wars left, right, and center, all in an effort to keep us angry at each other instead of angry at the actual sources of underdevelopment. I will end by saying it's all one big scam and we must be serious about calling it what it is, a Western designed, Western dominated scam that requires our commitment and our resolve to shut it down if we're serious about meeting African aspirations. Thank you.